so basically today i will speak on this topic of india's spiritual contributions so first i'll start with how i started studying or researching on this topic and then then i'll explain my current understanding of the issue so basically we started with we know the famous incident where shri prabhupada was told by bhakti sanskar thakur that independence is just temporary political struggle is temporary we focus more on sharing krishna consciousness so i was trying to understand what was the reason why bhakti sanskar thakur had this position so i talk about broadly okay we have another matter so if we have say four different conceptions so one so if we consider say okay it's not working see this is the whole world this is world and within that this is india so so within this the idea was from india india is bharat the land with spiritual knowledge with lit with knowledge bharat so from india spiritual knowledge will go all over the world that is one idea i'll explain all of these one by one And the second is that more or less so this was the traditional conception which was present for a significant amount of time in india then after that there is the west now i'll explain what i mean by the west no, and no, then no, there no, is no, the no. rest <laughs> <laughs> so more or less this was the phase in world history when the rest of the world was exploited by the west so within that of course india comes in so then the third topic okay. so then after that we had it's okay fine then after that there was the cold war obviously that more or less of the second world war so we had the so more or less the in the first world which was again the west america europe primarily fw is the first world then there was a if you want to call it the second world that word was not very common this, this so this was capitalism and then this was communism and india was you could say officially india was non aligned there was a this movement called non alignment movement nam and india was supposed to be a part of that but india was substantially connected with the with russia, soviet russia and this is more or less as i said the time when krishna consciousness started and it spread across the india across the world and came back to india and now you can see the current world order if you see so during this time the west was still dominating after the cold war was won now after that the way the world is say usa is one power china is another power india is another power and then we have the rest of the world so we'll see how the conceptions of the world have shaped the understanding of how india can present its spirituality to the rest of the world start with you can see the bhakti no thakur bhakti no thakur was living at the time when the indian independence movement started spreading i think the indian national congress was started establishing 1885 now today we can consider congress to be a party which is often quite anti vedic 
many ways, but at that time, it was the main expression of India's not just political aspirations, but even spiritual aspirations in terms of restoring India's traditional culture and traditional wisdom. And it also largely many of the pioneering leaders were from Bengal. If you consider those who started the Congress, you know, you know Thakur also at more or less the same time. In the peak years of his contributions were around 1875 to 1900. After that, he retired in 1915, around 1915, he departed from the world. So, so, during this time, as the Indian independence movement was growing, so many of the songs like Baba, Bande Matram, Bhakti Chandra Chatterjee, all this came from the uh, came from uh, Bengal to some extent. At that time, Bhakti Vinod Thakur took a significantly contrarian position. That means many of his compatriots, many of his colleagues, people influential among the Bengali intelligentsia, they were agitating for India's political rights. At that time, independence was not something political rights more and more. And if is more interested in spiritual growth and wants to focus on uh, spiritual wisdom, internalizing, sharing. And the younger brother is more interested in, um, in managing the business, expanding the estate, expanding the estate. So he said, there can be a division of labor among the two. Let the younger sibling take care of the material interests and let the his older brother take care of the spiritual interests. And interestingly, okay, am I audible? Okay. So he compared. Is that video? So he com. Do I need this then? Okay. If I get up, I'll use this. No. No, 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 no. Okay. Thank you. I don't think I, I'm, going, I'm going to get up now. One thing. So, and he compared India to that older brother and Britain at that time to the younger brother. <laughs> so he said, let Britain take care of the political affairs of India and let Indians focus on studying and sharing its spiritual wisdom. So now, if you consider the statement in the historical context, at one level, it was quite contrarian. As I said, contrarian is contradictory to the mainstream opinion at that time. So, Bhakti Thakur writes at that time that he says that as compared to the Islamic rule, we are able to uh, worship our temple, we have to worship our gods in our temples, we are able to practice our bhakti. So there is no, uh, as compared to the past, our present situation is much better. So let us now focus on uh, our on spiritual growth. So this will be the contribution of India. Of course, I'm paraphrasing this, but this is essentially what he says in his writings. Now, if you see, initially when the British came to India, they observed how the, uh, how the Mughal rule collapsed. You know, it is, uh, Aurangzeb was known to be extremely fanatical. And we hear from one side how he was so depraved, destroyed so many temples, persecuted so many people. Not just against Hindus, even six, he, six leaders he crucified, uh, he killed. So he was brutal. That is all true. But another perspective, another important point is that Aurangzeb was singularly responsible for the destruction of one of the largest and longest lasting empires in world history. Because what happened was is because of his fanaticism, he made enemies everywhere. And if you consider the world history, there have been great conquerors, like Alexander was a great conqueror, but he never was able to sustain an empire for a very long time. By the time of his death, on the, many of the kingdoms that he had conquered were lost. But if we consider the Islamic rule also, there were many different kings before the Mughal empire, there were other Islamic rulers. 
but from the time of babar down to aurangzeb and the mughal empire was one of the longest lasting empires in not just indian history but across the world history one dynasty ruling for a long time and when aurangzeb inherited it it was extremely powerful but by the end of by the near end of his life within that i mean after that it just collapsed so the british drew their lessons from this that religious intolerance has a political cost so they this is strict initially at least they very strictly followed the policy of not interfering with the religious activities of the hindus they said let, let them practice the east india company primarily came for commercial interests so in fact when they had the power, rulership over jagannath puri so like when some big head of state or somebody comes you have a guard of honor and then you shoot in the air to welcome them so at that time they would have the british army soldiers soldiers were of course indians hired by them but they would be like a guard of honor going with jagannath's temple jagannath's chariot so they offered a lot of respect for indian cultural rituals cultural practices that was the initial time of course things started changing 1857 there was the rebellion and they crushed it quite severely but even the 1857 rebellion they saw it more as hindus and muslims both came together and they also said okay we agitated the the religious interests of these people because the, you know they they wanted they had these bullets which had both um, cow meat and pork pig meat so both hindus and muslims were angry so overall the policy was religious non interference but in the early years of the east india company's rule they had banned mission christian missionaries from coming to india so outside of india there was a place called sirampur where the missionaries would have their base and from there they would sneak into bengal they try to distribute pamphlets do some preaching and then go back because the east india company was very aggressively against it now it was not that they were they were appreciative of indian culture or indian spirituality they just were more interested in finance and they saw so their inference of bhai aurangzeb fell we can say that shivaji maharaj was very heroic and things like that all that is true also well generally for complex historical events or for major historical events we don't have one explanation there are multiple causes but this they were very cautious that we don't want to mix religion with business but oh, but in britain also there were like uh, most countries uh, india has many political parties but uk has two uh, usa has two political parties democrats and republicans like britain also has two political had at time two political parties so one of them was very pro science rational and the other was pro christianity hmm? and they were bitterly competing so around after around bhakti no thakur's time or little after bhakti no thakur's time the pro christian party started becoming more stronger but interestingly both the pro christian and the pro science parties they were both felt that indians from a christian perspective this is a pagan religion from the scientific perspective this is a irrational culture so both were against hinduism in one sense but the east india company as long as it had power it restrained things it did not religious let religious interest come to surface but eventually after the 1857 rebellion the british government said that you know you will not be able to control this they so we will use our party and they took over the company so they took over the rule of india before that india was not ruled actually by britain india was ruled by a company from britain hmm? but anyway so bhakti no thakur was from that perspective that india's political interests are india is politically better managed than in the past so don't bother about political issues focus on the spiritual wisdom and this was what bhakti sanan thakur also continued in fact bhakti sanan thakur was in one sense even more uh, contrarian at times now india had three major independence struggle 1920 21 that was the non non cooperation movement 1930 31 that was the civil disobedience and 1942 onwards was the quit india movement so in the first movement 1920 21 and 1930 31 both of these times bhakti sanan thakur took a position opposite to the independence movement when india was churning now we cannot really say india was churning with uh, nationalistic sentiment because even at its peak not everybody in india was involved in the independence movement most people were living in the villages and they were going on with their lives but still it was significant sentiment was there 
even at those times bhatan sir akur actually courted the governor general of uh, of the british government said invited him to come to mayapur and to kolkata and hosted them and he maintained very friendly relationship with them so the idea was that he also told prabhu padmini in 1922 that you know, this independence is temporary focus on spiritual guru focus on spiritual wisdom sharing it and that has been the broad mood of our tradition the political changes come and go uh, now this is this a absolute principle i'll explain that as i said bhaktino thakur took a particular position in response to a particular historical situation mm-hmm. uh, and we'll come back to this once again as a circle so this is the first this is what our tradition has largely adopted and prabhupada also adopted now prabhupada also mentioned some of the other approaches i'll come to that one by one now over a period of time what happened was the west so during before the first world war west primarily meant uk europe but primarily uk and also other countries were there like france had its colonial empire portugal had its colonial empire portugal primarily went to south america spain spain and portugal they went to south america so basically europe was divided amongst catholics and protestants so the protestants came into north america and they came to asia so they so india if you india was primarily ruled by protestants protestant christians and the catholics they went to south america that's why even now in south america catholic presence is quite strong mm-hmm. so what happened was during this time so it was not just economic rule but it was systematic economic exploitation started so there is a big difference between the from a cultural perspective you can say that the muslims were more destructive for india than the british in terms of destroying temples overtly but the many of the muslims they made india their home they based themselves in india. of course many indians only hindus only converted to islam but many of the ruler uh, invading dynasties who came from came from the middle east or the uh, south of north of india limit they made india their home so in india's prosperity lay their prosperity so there were invaders who often came, who sometimes came and plundered indian cities and they took wealth and wealth but others they wanted india to be prosperous so that they would get their taxes and they would be prosperous uh, mostly muslim rulers were like that so after the but the, the british came the british never considered india to be a home. very very few so there is one british author he said that india is like a nightmare of heat disease barbarism and superstition so that was his idea it's terribly hot filled with horrible diseases barbaric people with all kinds of rituals and they are all very superstitious so so for most of the british executives or british government rulers or whoever like being sent to india as something like for indians to be sent to andaman nicobar <laughs> <laughs> they considered posting in india to be like a punishment mm-hmm. and they just wanted to be here for as much time as whatever was required and flee india so that's why much of the indian economic infrastructure was destroyed by the british you know that when bengal bengal had a flourishing uh, handloom industry and britain wanted their own cotton mills in manchester especially famous for that to flourish so when they con- when they conquered dhaka and the remaining areas just came and statistics vary but about 1 million handloomers they just went to their homes and cut off their thumbs of 1 million people so it was like within a week or within a month or so the entire industry that had been existing for thousands of years just collapsed completely now again the count of million may be inflammatory may but it is significant that that the whole industry collapsed was true so what happened was on one side it was not just political domination it was economic exploitation and eventually it was also uh, they they felt that these indians are uh, primitive mm? they are as i said barbaric so radiard complete kipling read a wrote a, wrote a song where he said it is the white man's burden to actually civilize the rest of humanity so they considered it that these indians are uncivilized people and we have to civilize them so they cons- they had this almost sort of religious righteousness or moral righteousness in destroying india's culture 
So with this in mind, what happened? So why West and the rest? And the West became wealthy, West became powerful, but it was at the expense of the rest of the world. So Gandhi famously said that when he was asked, will India follow the model of the West of UK, uh, West in development? So he said, for one UK to be developed, one whole India was required. Hmm? But if India is to develop by UK's model, we will need several Earths. And we have only one Earth. So, so, <laughs> so basically, although Britain had a huge empire, India was like the, what they call it, the crown jewel of the British empire. And without India, Britain would not have flourished at all. So, so between, so, and after the second world war, uh, although colonialism ended, but still Britain, UK became a quite a, if not so much a political, as a political superpower, it was challenged by USSR for a good amount of time, but still it remained a cultural superpower. So Hollywood started, Hollywood and its culture started getting exported all over the world. So the idea was that the West is bad and the rest has been exploited by the West. So we will see within India, this West and East, East, generally when we use the word East, it refers to India, although from the West perspective, China is also included in the East. But this West and India, this tension, and that is quite common. If you see many, it was not that common in Prabhupada's writings. It's not, that, it's not there, it is there. But Prabhupada's focus was more on sense gratification and giving of sense gratification, giving of the bodily concept of life. He would talk about Western culture in terms of say, people dressing obscenely and, and overemphasis on free sex and things like that. But Prabhupada was not very fixated on West versus India. Prabhupada's focus was more on that. See, even the West is practicing Indian culture. So what was so? so but overall, the Indian discourse was that the West is bad and India is good. In fact, if anything, if anything is bad in India, it is because of the West. And we will see that this discourse is present quite prominently even in our moment. That in, in our most of our classes, we'll say Western culture is because this is being spoiled because of Western culture. This is happening because of the West. And I'm not saying it is wrong, but this is something which is not so prominent in Prabhupada's writings, which, which comes over here. And this was a reaction. Um, Prabhupada did not speak very strongly against colonialism, for example. Prabhupada did not address this West India dynamic so much. Even when Prabhupada talks about the Christian missionaries coming to India, he doesn't really strongly criticize them. He, he, in fact, there's a letter where he says, you know, if the British go, if the Indian government is allowing missionaries, Christian missionaries to come and missionize in India, then why are they not giving passports uh, to our visas to our Indian, to our Hare Krishna devotees? Something like this. Uh, so I will come back to each of these models once again. So now if we consider, has the West exploited the rest of the world? Yes, definitely too. No doubt about it. But is, see, generally what happens in any, like I earlier said, reality is very complex. And when we ascribe the problems of reality to one particular cause, then often it is an oversimplified explanation. This one cause can be very prominent, but when we make that the sole cause, then it becomes, it becomes more agenda driven than fact driven. So I'll give a couple of examples. This might be controversial and later on you can comment if you want to. If you consider the caste system in India, now we may intellectually say caste system is different from Varanashram, but the fact is it is where in India is Varanashram as we conceive of it being practiced. India's reality is the caste system and the caste system as it existed at least for quite a few centuries was severely discriminated. Even now, caste-based politics are quite common in, in India. Now, if you see the caste system has decreased its influence in urban India. In rural India, it is still there. So, so how has this happened? If most of us, we start, if we studied in engineering college or we worked in software company, how many of us were really conscious which of our colleagues or post students are from which caste? And not much, it was not a prominent part of this. So how has this happened? To some extent, we need to, at least, we need to give credit where it is due. That this is due to urbanization and westernization. The caste system 
was dismantled. The discriminatory caste system was dismantled, uh, where has been dismantled, or at least decreased in power, wherever there is the influence of the West in terms of urbanization and in terms of uh, of Western education, Western ethos of egalitarianism, where people work together collegially. Now, I'm not saying that the West caused this, or even the West intended to cause this. I'm talking about a correlation, not a causation. That means urbanization is the place where caste influence has decreased. Now, is, so how did this happen? To, if you see the Bhakti movement also worked against the caste system. And the Bhakti movement also that, that this caste discrimination is everybody can become spiritually conscious. So it did work as like an internal reform movement. But the point was Bhakti did the Bhakti movement didn't really deliver the lower castes. It delivered only those members of the lower caste who became bhaktas. Those who did not become bhaktas, their condition was not much improved by the by the bhakti movement. This is not a criticism because bhakti movement was not meant for social reform primarily. It was meant for spiritual elevation, and social reform was a fringe benefit. So the point is the West. Now again, I'm not saying in any way that the West is not bad or the West is good. It is just not black and white. This is one way of looking at reality, and it is it has its value and validity. But to say that the West is the cause of all the problems of India, well, that may not be a fully accurate assessment. Now, if you move forward to the third one, see what happened is, we'll come back to each of these, but let me complete this. Uh, in th after India got independence, mm -hmm. see for many Indian leaders of the independence movement, um, for them, the independence struggle was not just political. It was also spiritual. If we consider many of the leaders, even they considered uh, Maharashtra, there was Tilak, there was Aurobindo Ghosh, and then Radha Krishnan. They were all, many of them were spiritual leaders. At least they were spiritually well-read. And they saw that India will be able to grow spiritual. Gandhi himself, we may not agree with his philosophical conclusion some ways. He was a teaching of non-violence as a conclusion, as a sense of the Gita. But he was quite a spiritual person in his own way. So, the Indian political movement, political struggle for independence was very deeply linked with the spiritual struggle for regaining and restoring India's culture, India's spiritual culture. But unfortunately, two things completely disrupted this. So when this India versus the West conflict was there, that the West was not only economically exploiting and politically dominating India, but it was also spiritually corrupting India, spiritually destroying India. So it was you know, a combined effort. We want to restore the culture, the economics, the politics, and the spirituality. But two incidents happened around the time of India's independence, which disrupted completely the, spir the spiritual side of India's political struggle. The first was the partition. The partition was a ex you know, extremely, you, know, you could say, bloody event. You know, if you say that, uh, now at that time, statistics were not kept very well. But 6 million people, Jews were killed in, by the Holocaust. And about 6 million other people were killed by the, British, by the Germans, Nazis. But estimates say about 1 million people, I mean, one sixth of what were killed in the German Nazi camps, that many people died during the partition, both in India and Pakistan. It is actually one of the, one of the nightmare events in the 20th century. And this was seen to be, or at least perceived as being caused by religion. Mm -hmm. It was it was the religious tension between India and between Hindus and Muslims that caused this. I'm not going to go into analysis of what actually caused the partition, but how it was seen. Seen by whom? By Nehru and other political leaders of India. And the second was the assassination of, assassination of Gandhi. So what happened? You see, in India, for many Indian, spirit, Indian people who are spiritually minded, young people, for them, spiritual India is often seen as Swami Vivekananda, going to the going to Chicago and speaking at the conference of world religions. Now, as far as America itself is concerned, Swami Vivekananda is not a very influential person. He came, he spoke and he went. In the West's uh, cultural conceptions, spiritual India was represented the most by Gandhiji. You know, Gandhiji inspired Martin Luther King, Gandhiji inspired Nelson Mandela. And so the fact that such a person, Einstein also spoke very greatly in praise of Gandhiji. So many icons of the West, 
they considered that india was a great example of after especially after the second world war it was bloody and india achieved independence by non violent means so and non violence was seen as spiritual so when such a iconic spiritual person was assassinated and by whom by a hindu fanatic that's how it was portrayed that was it was perceived so that actually put hinduism completely on the back foot in fact the organizations which were the uh, progenitors which were the pre- precursors of the bjp rss bhp or associate with them they were banned after the assassination of uh, gandhi ji for some time so now both of these that oh this bloody partition happened because of religion and such a iconic spiritual relig- leader was killed because of religion so because of that the indian government either they wanted to do it i mean maybe and nehru and his associates they either wanted to do it or they believed they were actually doing good for india we don't know that and i won't want to go into nehru's uh, spiritual conceptions but basically he chose that put religion all aside if india wants to progress religion will be the biggest obstacle for india's progress so just put religion aside and focus on india's economic progress and also along with that nehru personally was although he was educated in the west he was like most indian political leaders he was educated in uk but he was quite influenced by so by by the eastern bloc by that that is by ussr he adopted the so ussr adopted communism so he didn't adopt communism but he adopted socialism now communism is aggressively anti religion mm-hmm. the so, religion is the opium of the masses as karl marx famously said and so socialism is not that aggressively persecuting religion but it did you could say sideline religion substantially so even now there are some devotees who are working to try to have, have india is among the few countries in the world which does not have in its academy religious studies as a department it doesn't have it only If you want to do religious studies, you have to go through philosophy, or you have to go to sociology, or through some other subjects. So that there is a reason for that. Now, in this particular context, now apart from that, so in Nehru's times, religion as a uh, as something which the state would do, that was consciously avoided. So even now, Radha Krishna, Radha Hind Prasad, both of them presidents, they were relatively spiritually minded people. so when some old temp- uh, temples were being new temples were being constructed they wanted to go so nehru strongly told them don't go there we have to keep religion and state separate so because of that what happened was now he couldn't change the fact that religion was a very prominent part of the lived life of most indians mm-hmm. there is some survey done that it's funny that actually indian muslims practice islam more diligently than muslims in arabia you know in saudi arabia or kuwait or whatever that the state is theocratic but they may not be as diligent in doing namaz five times and doing all the prayers and things like that but indian muslims are more diligent so now why is that and it's ironic because you know if you consider they say that okay hinduism has a caste system but something like a hierarchy exists there also the muslims in 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 arabia basically that part. they consider we are the original muslims all of you are converted muslims so you are lower class so so they they, they look down upon them so now why is it well one reason could be that india is a land of religion so whichever religion people may belong to they will practice that diligently <laughs> now of course that can have fanatical overtones hmm? fanatical that can have fanatical overtones but it is true that uh, religion is a very strong part of people's lived reality so it was in this milieu in this culture in this environment that when shri prabhupad came back to india 1965 he went 1970 1968 he came back once 1970 he came back a second time and 1968 he was brought to the two three disciples with him kirtan maharaj was there and a couple of other disciples were there 1970 he brought a whole bus load of disciples and that was the time when he started doing all india tours and when he did this uh, festival in cross maidan the times of india reported that there was a, there was a, like the editor of the main editor of times of india he had come to attend the 
the the Mahasatsang program, and he he reported that he says words can't describe my joy to see how these Westerners who had dominated India for so long, who had ruled India, who had conquered India, they are now being conquered by India's culture. And so that which was sidelined by the state, the religious sentiment, the religious pride, the religious, religious longing, that got a very powerful vindication. Vindication means transformation. Yeah, this, this is so great. Now what happened by this is that these people, for them, they were, if you see between 1960 and 1970, is before Prabhupada went to America, and after he came back from America or uh, West in general, it is there was no major difference in the number of people who committed themselves to Srila Prabhupada's movement as dedicated followers. We don't have many Indian disciples of Srila Prabhupada who were introduced in India. We have a few, but none of them were very inf influential during Prabhupada's times. Over the years, they have become dedicated. And they have become prominent leaders. So during that time, but many people became life members. Many people became very influential. They, they're already influential and they use their influence for building temples. So their attraction was more of a cultural national pride. That if, see, although the Indian government had sidelined, had sidelined religion for a long time, but in, from India, many spiritual teachers had been going to the West. From Swami Vivekananda to Swami Ram to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, many of them were going. But none of them emphasized the cultural aspect of India. When Swami Ram or Raman Maharshi, they brought back their followers. The Beatles didn't wear dhoti kurta or sari when they came to India. They came to his retreat, but they were continued to have their Western dress. But Prabhupada, when he came back, he actually, his followers, they adopted Indian culture. So see, adopting thought system is internal. That's important. But from, for people to see it is a culture. Okay, how do you dress? How do you eat? Things like that. So this cultural aspect was not so much the emphasis of Bhaktasana Svitakura also. Now Bhaktasana Svitakura, as we know, he himself would wear Western or what you can call it, civil clothes. In fact, he did a once a whole satsang program. In Radha, he went to Radha Kund wearing Western civil clothes. And he had his own disciples. He said that you, know, you should, uh, most of his disciples, based on his guidance, when they went to the West, they were wearing Western clothes, normal clothes, what are considered normal clothes. But Prabhupada emphasized this cultural aspect. And of course, you know, there's one mission, one purpose, but that may be executed in different ways. So from the perspective of Prabhupada's purpose that, you know, see, even the Western people are following what you're doing. So if Western, some Western person comes and says, oh, Bhagavad Gita is very good. Okay, nice. But that will not impact people as much as the Western person taking Indian food or wearing Indian dress. Because what happens is, in one sense, you can say philosophy is like science and culture is like technology. Hmm? What I mean by that is, like very few people will understand how the internet works. But millions and millions, billions of people will work with the internet. So science is not understood by many people, but technology is understood by and used by a lot of people. So like that, philosophy is not understood by many people, but culture is understood, adopted, and it impresses a lot of people. So Prabhupada, in that sense, used culture as a way of, of inspiring Indians to turn towards India's own lost spiritual heritage. And in this context, you will see that Prabhupada Rather than saying, you know, oh, India is great and West is bad, he had more like East-West synthesis, blind man, lame man. And he also, he also said that at times, if you go to the Juhu temple, there are some letters of Prabhupada and there's one letter where Prabhupada says, no, I'm very disappointed with Indians. They, not only have they not supported this movement, they're constantly opposing this movement. Because what happened was that, again, we, the political history was, when the war happened between India and Pakistan, at that time, America supported Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And if he, uh, uh, India would have been in big trouble if USSR had not come to the help. Of course, they didn't come out of selflessness. But they helped by sending some ships and some, some weapons and things like that. So because of that, Indians were suspicious, or at least Indian government and Indian, some, some parts of India were suspicious of America. And that suspicion carried over to the 
Indian, uh, the de- American devotees in India also. So Prabhupada, in one sense, he was disappointed. He said, expressed disappointment in India and is very appreciative of the West of America. Hmm? Now that was in a particular, again, particular cultural context. So now, if you consider the world as it exists, see, nineteen, we consider Second World War was a big event. After which, these two blocks were formed. And Prabhupada also refers to these two blocks. Say, for example, the issue of Nishadi says that the capitalists and communists are fighting both. But unless everybody accepts that it is not the property, communism says everything is the property of the state. Capitalism says everybody, everything is the property of whoever has talent or wealth or power. But is that actually everything is the property of God? Unless that is accepted, both will fight and they will destroy each other. So Prabhupada is talking about weapons of mass destruction being there and the world destruction coming up. So Prabhupada is commenting in this context. The capital, capitalist communist war. Now around 1987 to 89, USSR fell. And after that, more or less, America was unilateral world power for some time. But to, uh, 9-11, 9-11 was just, a, India has been subjected to many terrorist attacks. So the Mumbai terrorist attack was quite bad in 7-11 as they call it. But, uh, but still it did not, no terrorist attack affected the Indian psyche as much as 9-11 affected the American psyche. They say, as they say, American history, they divide into modern history they, or recent history, they divide into pre-9-11 and post-9-11. From our devotees' perspective, of Indians' perspective, before 9-11, it was very easy to immigrate to America. It was very easy to, to get visas, to get a green card, to settle over there. After 9-11, it's become much more difficult. But the point why I'm talking about 9-11 over here is, that after that, from that time onwards, America's control over the world went down. And now with the Afghanistan debacle and everything, uh, the world is no longer unipolar. So on one side, China is rising. Now India is also rising to some extent. And India does have some advantages over China. One big advantage is that India has a strong, India has a much bigger uh, youth population, young population than China. See, what happened, both India and China were very strongly concerned about the population explosion. And China adopted the policy of one or none. That they had a forced, uh, what is the word for it? Sorry? Sterilization, yeah. It's one technical word, word, but forced sterilization. So you have one child or no child. And they managed to flatten the population growth curve. But the problem was that no, if you have just one child and your one child turns sickly or uh, dies or whatever, then what do you do? So now they're trying to reverse the effects of that. But the prominent pop- uh, Chinese population is much older. Indian population is a little younger. So in the next 15, 20 years, if India goes on the same trajectory as it is going, India can equal or even exceed China's potential. So in, in the world today, what has happened is if you consider America, um, Indians are considered to be the wealthiest minority in America. <laughs> you know, Indians are, in fact, Indians are often envied in America. Now, envy, you can say, is respect offered unwillingly and resentfully. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as one devotee who is one American traffic cop who's become a devotee. So I was talking with him in Florida. So he was telling that practically never I have to pull over Indian youth for driving drunk or Indians for driving, for speeding and drinking. And he says, you know, Indians are law abiding, tax paying and responsible. You know, Indians, Indian kids hardly ever end up in the social welfare system. Even if there is somebody other takes care of them. So they, they are like upstanding citizens. I have traveled in South, in South America also. I've gone to several countries. It's, it's ironic that wherever the world have gone, Indians are respected, but India is not much respected. <laughs> what I mean is wherever Indians go, Indians are a part of the part of the they, they are responsible in, in doing their duty. So they contribute to the country wherever they go. They also become wealthy relatively speaking, but they contribute. Now, Chinese are also similarly hardworking. But Chinese are often, again, I don't want to generalize because uh, there are always exceptions. But still, generalizations give some understanding. 
the chinese are more than envied they are feared why multiple reasons one main reason is that the chinese government works very actively with chinese expatriates when those who leave china and go to other countries if they become wealthy if they become well educated they go into position the chinese government their embassy very actively works in networking with them in okay, how they can promote chinese interests you will practically not see any hollywood movie which will portray china in a negative light hmm? many hollywood movies in the cold war times and afterwards portray russia in a negative light now that has also decreased but there are many hollywood movies which will portray india in a negative light because indian india although india has a lot of influence but we don't leverage it so much hmm. now hollywood knows that if they portray china negatively chinese government will ban that movie and they lose a 1 billion market a billion count market but the point i'm making is the world is very different today from what it was in the past and <laughs> india is now or the indians uh, india is now experiencing a significant spiritual regeneration also it is not just because of the current uh, political government but overall things have happened in such a way that see when indians initially go to the west they want to enjoy they go to college time that they go to they study and things like they st- they study they get a job they want to enjoy it's a free culture but once they start having children now at least whatever we may say about indian parents they really are concerned about the children and they say that i don't want my children to Uh, to grow the way western kids are growing now they get into drugs they get into sexuality in very young age they become sexually active at very young age so they want to transmit transmit indian culture to their children and that is why many indians do become spiritually minded especially once they come to the 35 40 not necessarily committed spiritually the way we think about it no not we not do 16 rounds sadhana but they want to understand to some extent and transmit their spirituality now these statistics i have not been able to confirm but apparently from something like 1985 to 2015 in the that was the statistics which i read i when i actually i i i read i had found the statistics when i wrote my book idol worship idol worship in these 30 years from 1985 to 19, 2015 more hindu temples have been constructed across the world then in the previous 300 years because previous 300 years hinduism was not across the world and in india hinduism was not in power islam was there and britain was there so at that time indians were not having so much wealth so indian spirituality has been spread by indians to at least at some level and the west has also become receptive to yoga and ayurveda and alternative medicine so what has happened is india is seen differently in today's world that oh the west is bad and india is good that was a particular dynamic which is still relevant in some parts of india but now it's a it's a multipolar world it's not like one side has all the power and other side doesn't have all the power so india is exporting india has exported software engineers to the west india has exported a highly educated working force india is rich in natural resources and india is also providing spiritual wisdom and people are open for that so now if you consider this perspectives these four perspectives each of these i could go more elaborately into this the point why i analyze this is this particular way is for two reasons that all of us we come from particular backgrounds we have grown up with particular conceptions and we may naturally identify with one of these so some of us may very strongly identify with how western culture is bad and indian culture is great and that is fine if that is our inspiration and that is how we will preach there are others who may feel that yeah actually you know there is good and bad everywhere what happens is if you consider even the west the west is not monolithic you know if you consider uh, that even in the west there is uh, there is strong uh, level of religious influence although that is not the part of the west that is been exported to the rest of the world mm-hmm. so uh, in the west also there is uh, opposition that is a if you consider america republican party is quite strongly opposed to abortion the democrats are very strongly in it strongly in favor of it so it's complex there also wherever christian influences there christians may not be receptive or appreciative of hinduism 
but they are appreciative of religious rights and when our movement was uh, was accused of brainwashing no it was not just lilamrut gives with all due respect lilamrut gives the history of iskon from a very you could say a triumphalist or a self congratulatory perspective that means what yeah yeah we were so great and we did so much means of course it was glorification of prabhupada but actually we won the brainwashing case not just because of confrontational arguments it was many prominent christian organizations at that time they came forward their scholars and their leaders they came forward and said that actually the hari krishna is an ancient indian religion it was not that they, it is not that they loved hari krishna that is not the reason but they felt that if today this religion is declared as a cult and its practice is stopped by the state or by the deprogrammers tomorrow christianity may also face the same fate and that's why they focus on the common interests so the point i'm making is that the east versus west dynamic it can work for certain audiences but it is not the absolute reality so the in the today's world you know if we consider his own radhanath maharaj in his in his outreach he at least in the recent few years whatever classes he hardly talks about the western civilization negatively he talks about selfishness versus service attitude and these are values that everybody can appreciate now uh, maharaj has spoken 1990 about cat cat's dog animals swabit varaus the kare that kind of thing but he will not adopt that tone now mm-hmm. so what is that? it depends on not just uh, where a person is preaching but what is the mood of the world see unfortunately in today's world the mood is that if you criticize any broad community you are treated as a fanatic so if somebody criticizes islam and immediately you are a islamophobe so it is undeniable that the maximum amount of terrorism is associated with islam i'm not saying it's caused by islam but it's associated with islam but the united nations recently adopted a international day for prevention of islamophobia there is no international day for prevention of islamic extremism but there is international day for prevention of islamophobia so now why is this uh, there are many reasons for it uh, here we have to actually appreciate the brilliance of islamic scholars islamic scholars have work work together with leftist scholars that although islam is associated with extremism but what the the they have marketed things so expertly that anybody who associates islam with extremism is considered an extremist hmm? that you oh, all this, so even when george bush decided to attack afghanistan after 911 the first thing he did now george bush was a republican uh, and republicans are quite strongly christian and they are critical of other but even the first thing he did after 911 was he visited a mosque and he said our war is not against islam it is against islamic extremism obama was criticized quite by a lot of people when is isis was actually conquering the world he refused to use the word islamic terror yes it is it is extremist terrorist organizations are doing this although in the name of islam it is isis the name of islam was there but he was going to the political correctness to a large extreme to a, to a very great extreme the point i am making is when we generalize generalize and criticize in today's world especially among thoughtful people or people who think that they are thoughtful <laughs> uh, they start seeing us as fanatic oh, you say this whole group of people is like this how can you be so judgmental how can you be so short sighted how can you be so narrow minded so now rather than criticizing any group of people uh, if we focus on presenting our, what we can add value to the how our tradition and our teachings our traditional teachings can add value to people's lives then that has a lot of resonance if you see in india also our i'll conclude this point till even till 1985 around 1990 iskon was not very widespread i was talking with one of the juhu leaders recently he said that in the early days of the juhu temple they would actually um, that they would actually go to the railway station near juhu and they said hey all of you you people why are you sleeping on the railway station? you come and stay inside the temple we'll give you food and you do some seva so that's how we were recruiting people for our movement 
Now, again, this is, you could say it's extreme, but it was, it was the reality. Very few people actually wanted to join full time. Now, from uh, roughly from 1985, 1990, our movement started spreading. And while it is spreading all over India, you can say three parts of India is we have spread quite substantially in Bengal under Jayapada Maharaj, around Delhi, North India area under uh, Opal Krishna Maharaj. And if you consider Mumbai and the uh, associated areas, Maharashtra under Zonu Sanadhanath Maharaj. So if you see all three of them, there are others or leaders also are influential in their own way, but not to that degree. So none of them have a very strongly confrontational attitude. Hmm? That is, focus on what the spirituality is contributing. And this way, it is not that people who have nationalistic interests, people who have environmental interests, people who have, say, yoga interests, people who have either, they all can come. Prabhupada says that all isms can be spiritualized by being used in Krishna's service. He says in Kurvane Vahe Karmani Tarkot. But so we can, we may ourselves be attracted by some ism and we can present Krishna consciousness in a way that attracts people who are attracted by certain isms. Hmm? But we don't have to equate Krishna consciousness with any ism. Krishna consciousness can work with many different isms. Hmm? It can, if you see Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is like spiritual communism. Hmm? So in says, is Krishna consciousness like communism then? Actual reality is that in communist countries, we are not even able to practice openly or to speak of spread, uh, spread luxuriantly. Most of our spread has been in capitalist countries where, where at least because of the freedom, we have religious freedom also. So is, is Krishna consciousness for communism or capitalism? Well, no, whatever be the circumstance, Krishna consciousness can find good within that and work with that to spread. So Indian, so for example, now, well, there are some devotees who still say, are we Hindu? We are not Hindu. We are Hindu. There's an influential uh, Hindu magazine called Hinduism today in America. It's not very well known in India, but in America it's quite influential. So they have one of their widely read articles, There's 15 reasons why ISKCON is not Hindu. And they say, that's right, because they quote Prabhupada says this, his followers say this, 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 this. Now, this is an unnecessary debate. Because you'll say, okay, well, are we Hindu? You say, we are certainly not Muslim. Is it? <laughs> so, we are certainly not Christian. So, see, there is Vyabaharik and there is Paramarthik. Vyabaharik means uh, practical and Paramarthik is transcendental. So, from a Paramarthic perspective, we are not Hindu. But if you are going to, we can't single that out. And we have to say, we are not Hindu, we are not Indians, say we are not males or females. Uh, we are not black or white. So if we single out only one Vyavaharic designation, say we are not that, then we alienate a lot of people. Because what happens is many Hindus find that we are very opportunistic. So when we need them, we'll say we are Hindus. When we don't need them, we say we are transcendental. <laughs> that can't work. That can't work. So uh, I am planning to travel to America tomorrow. So if I go to America and I go to the immigration, where are you? I can't say I'm a soul. You know, I have to show the Indian passport. That is Vyabaharik. So we have to operate at Vyabaharik level. So Vyabaharik level, there can be different isms. There can be nationalism, there can be regionalism, there can be various kinds of isms. And devotees have to be expert enough to work with these. So Prabhupada was expert. To Indians, he would say that this Bhagavad Gita is from India. And to preach Bhagavad Gita in India, I, I need people from the West to come here. You learn this and you share this with all over the world. And to his Western disciples, he would say, that when the first Hare Krishna festival was organized here, he said, all over the world, the Americans are known to do great things. What is the use of your being Americans if you don't do something wonderful for Krishna? Uh, what is Prabhupada doing here? Different isms, whether it is American nationalism or Indian nationalism, he was using in Krishna's service. Now, using doesn't mean being like opportunistic. Using means we respect those sentiments and then we direct those sentiments towards Krishna. So there, so so India, the topic was India's spiritual contributions. So how India will actually make its spiritual contributions to the world? Is it that Indian, because our Acharyas, they didn't identify with India's political struggles. So we should not at all identify with India's political struggles. Well, there's a contextual element to it. 
and that contextual element has to be understood, respected. But we have to look at a different context in today's world. So there's one Prabhupada disciple. He he said, you know, you Indians are so fixated with Christian conversions. Prabhupada never spoke about it. And then I, I, he came to India once. He went to Tirupati. He went to the Northeast. And he just suffered completely changed. So this is Northeast. There are some parts of the Northeast where you cannot actually wear Hindu clothes or do Harinam Sankirtan because there's so much aggressive Christianity is there. In Tirupati temple around also, you, you know, those of you gone to South India, you'll see there are so many Christian churches. He said, if Prabhupada had been here today, and Prabhupada has seen how much India's Dharmic, uh, India's Vedic culture is under attack by Christian missionaries, he would surely have spoken about it. At that time, it was not that big a threat. So what happens is there is a central purpose of the movement, that is of the tradition to raise people toward Krishna consciousness. Now, how exactly it will be implemented? Different acharyas may use different strategies. So not getting involved with politics. That was, say, Bhakti Sanat Thakur, Bhakti Thakur, Prabhupada's common denominator. But emphasizing the cultural aspect, that was distinctly Prabhupada's focus. So that, uh, that uh, wearing the West Indian dress, Indian food, emphasizing that kind of thing. That was not Bhakti Sanat Thakur or Bhakti Thakur's emphasis. That is Prabhupada. Now, that was what worked at that time. It worked in the West, it worked in India also. For the West, it was like adventurous. That, you know, oh, we are doing something radically new. We are wearing dress like kind of, nobody wears like kind of dress. It's the Western people at that time were radical revolutionaries. And Prabhupada gave them uh, such a far out revolution, they couldn't have imagined also. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, they would like to do crazy things. And what can be crazier than dancing in the streets and causing all the traffic to stop? Now, if earlier they had done it, they would have been arrested. But they became Hare Krishna and did it, and police were escorting them now. <laughs> so Prabhupada tapped into that uh, ra radical zeal of his followers, and it appealed to the Indian cultural sentiment also. But as things change, that same purpose may be served in different ways by, at, by different devotee leaders, by different devotees individually, and by different, by, at different times in our tradition history. So our purpose, India's spiritual contribution is that we want to share with the world resources for raising people's consciousness towards Krishna. But how India is conceived, how the world is conceived, how the relationship between India and the world will be conceived, that will vary according to time, place, circumstance. So uh, the India West uh, confrontational mood can work even today because India is such a vast country. It's almost like there are many, there are people who live different mental worlds in different parts of India. So what will work for one part of India may not work so well in another part. Of what, is the, what, is, what will work in one part of Mumbai may not work in another part of Mumbai also. So we understand our audience and then present things in a way that can that people can relate with. That as Bhakti Tethi Maharaj said, you know, we are meant to remove the obstacles for people to come to close to Krishna. Our presentation should not be such that it just creates more obstacles. So this way, if we understand the audience in present and actually the, what Mahaprabhu wanted us to do, that Janma Sartak Kari Kara Parotkar, we will be able to raise our consciousness without causing too much agitation and conflict. Because if there's too much agitation and conflict, that distracts our minds also. And then without causing, without making people have to go through unnecessary agitation and conflict to come closer to Krishna. That way we can try to fulfill the mandate that Mahaprabhu has given to all of us. So I'll summarize. I spoke today about these, these four different conceptions of India's of the of India's spiritual contributions based on the relationship between India and the rest of the world. So prominently in our tradition, from Bhakti Thakur's time, was a somewhat contrarian to the mainstream Indian position. While India was agitating for political independence, our acharyas focused more on spiritual spiritual growing internally and spiritual sharing externally. And that was from Bhakti Thakur's time that the British were relatively better in terms of allowing religious freedom as compared to the Muslims, uh, at least in the early years. But over time, as things changed, the West became more and more exploitative of the rest, and especially Britain was highly exploitative of India. And therefore, there was a certain amount of resentment. And it is still there in many parts of India, although it's slowly going past, so that the West is exporting terrible things to India. And so therefore, that radical differentiation, this is our culture, this is their culture, that can sometimes be helpful. 
but it is not that all the problems of all problems can be attributed to one cause so the west influence is largely negative but there some positive influences may also have been there so and the third was where the world was divided. so india for many in, of india's freedom fighters the struggle for independence was not just political but also spiritual but unfortunately the political partition of india due to religious uh, causes and the uh, assassination of gandhi ji which happened which was seen as done by a hindu fanatic that gave reasons for india's political leaders to put uh, put to sideline religion from the public square and but religion was still a prominent part of india's lived reality and in this time when religion was being neglected by the government and prabhupad came and showed how india's religion is so great that culturally western people are practicing it it created a sensation and prabhupad tapped into that cultural national sentiment cultural nationalistic sentiment at a time when india was under socialist control and trying to sideline religion and he got a tremendous response not so much in terms of dedicated following as in terms of appreciation and contribution then as the world changed further now it's not a not not a bipolar world or even a unipolar world it's like a multipolar world so here india is slowly flexing its muscles india india is india is seen positively in many ways materially in terms of having well educated people who travel across and are responsible citizens spiritually in terms of having yoga and alternative systems of medicine and things like that so here in in the contemporary ethos there is that if we generalize and criticize any group of people we are seen as fanatical as extremists as uh, judgmental that's why oh, west is bad or this religion is bad or this group is bad that kind of uh, that kind of discourse alienates a lot of people so instead if you simply focus on what our tradition and its teachings offer for adding value to people's lives we can attract a lot of people and in this way understanding our audience if we present krishna consciousness then we can play our part in fulfilling mahaprabhu's mandate to make our own life successful and help others make their life successful thank you very much hare krishna any questions comments yes yes of course sorry i can't hear you yes better yeah thank you for for such a wonderful presentation so in the end you uh, spoke this point um when this gandhi ji event happened mm. then it is perceived that uh, in the fanatic is the cause and the now current ethos is that the any any generalized the in general any community or group so it is a confrontation and it will be uh, termed as a fanatic so confront confrontation is not appreciated but on the other hand in uh, no, failing to confront we end up in not even defending the attacks on your own faith with respect to even krishna's criticism with respect to your worshipable personalities with respect to your values so which actually is even if you not criticizing for from the attack but the failing to defend to the, your own uh, your own okay. values yeah. and your faith that is also kind of a, it's counterproductive yeah fully agreed see i am very careful when i i want what in elaborating or emphasizing what i said i said it is generalizing and criticizing that you know this whole group is bad all british were bad or muslims are bad that kind of generalizing and criticizing is a problem and that is where we are seen as judgmental but i don't see that if we can if i mean i don't see any problem if we can rationally present that okay this is what you think our this is what is being portrayed our traditional teachings are but this is what actually our teachings are and in some ways social media has democratized outreach not entirely it is that you know, in the past if to get some good articles about hinduism published in mainstream newspapers was difficult 
but today the social media even is a even if somebody is criticizing something the alternative narrative can at least come in there is place for that so certainly we have to defend we have to present our perspective we have to correct if others are having misconceptions about or they are sharing misconceptions what i am saying is if even if it is 1 2 10 50 even if 90% of a particular group of people are always criticizing us that does not mean that whole group is to be treated as enemy that is my point when we generalize criticize demonize then it becomes a problem but certainly it's our duty to defend our duty to correct if we don't do that then we are failing in our duty what is as prabhupad wanted varnashram but he also wanted a primarily a brahmanical movement so brahmanas definitely need to intellectually defend so there are basically in religious discourse they say there are three ways of doing it there is polemic ironic and apologetic polemic means it's something like similar to arvitanda you are wrong whatever say if you say left i will say right like that so that's polemic ironic is you know actually you are also right and i am also right try to see the similarity in both things and there's no need to ex- aggravate the differences let's see what are commonalities and focus on them apologetic is you know how you are understanding me is wrong it has got nothing to do with apology apologetics is a entire branch of study where the way you are thinking of me is wrong so uh, apologetic is very good it's required apologetic mode of presentation again the word sounds very similar to apology it has nothing to do with apology uh, ironic is also good polemic sometimes becomes problematic but even polemic can be done in a way that is uh, if that is reasonable then it's not that criticism is the problem it is generalized criticism in fact uh, especially the western ethos is that you have a right to free speech and free speech means you should have the right to criticize also so of course there is a political correctness which is imposed by the left which does not allow certain things to be criticized that is true but my point is i don't think criticism is the problem so defending ourselves is not a problem it's certainly it's a duty but it is generalizing that becomes a problem is am i making the difference clear yes bro thank you so much bro so just just to make to come to complete this point you know so for example you may say aurangzeb was a muslim and aurangzeb destroyed so many temples which is true i keep forgetting i think aurangzeb was a shia and actually aurangzeb was the single biggest cause of, he caused the single biggest purge of sunni muslims in india his brother dara shuko was a sunni and he killed him and he killed all those who supported him so if you consider islamic history in, in current india in, in islam shia sunni differences we hardly ever hear about it they are coming more in the middle east but sunnis were also annihilated by aurangzeb so religious fanaticism is such that it will not only hurt other religions it will even hurt others belong to the same religion who do not agree with that group so aurangzeb was bad does that mean all muslims are bad no aurangzeb also attacked other muslims so that that generalization the pointing out all the wrong that aurangzeb did that we should do that you now the history is being distorted in the mainstream textbooks and things like that we need to correct that but what happens is instead of grounding ourselves in facts and carefully articulate reasoning when somebody makes generalized leaps then immediately unfortunately what happens is especially today if any person who is a hindutva activist criticizes aurangzeb or even points out that the way aurangzeb is portrayed in his textbooks is wrong immediately they are said you are a islamophobe who wants to saffronize indian textbooks so that is unfortunate that's why it has to be done carefully it's a generalized criticism is a problem but not specific pointing out of facts with reason and logic that is required okay. yes thank you so much really for the refreshing lectures for morning and now uh, the lecture class and uh, we would request you to please keep visiting us often as more often as possible uh, i have a question uh, regarding this i think there was a project related to uh, redefining and rewriting the textbooks and uh, related to that uh, what you said about the islamic scholars have done a fantastic job with the textbooks to to you know kind of keep them steer them clear of all this thing and give them a positive light uh, what 
is being done or what can be done to do the same for our tradition because anything that as soon as you you know anything uh, for example we are doing some programs in colleges so the authority were by nature defensive for anything which has to do with Hindus uh, yeah. or so what can be done on a um, strategic level for creating a positive image to scholarship. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we are also exploring. I don't. So the question is that, you know, as soon as we try to do any activities promoting dharma, it's seen as Hindutva, right-wing extremism, and then it's seen suspiciously. So, what can we do about it? Well, I don't see that there's any one answer. But basically, if we can show that how the wisdom that we are offering solves problems that the particular community that we are reaching out is facing. So students face for depression, stress, or suicidal urges, addiction. And what we can offer can help deal with that. That can be self-help, but it can grow beyond self-help to spiritual help also. So if we present with that focus, it is fairly acceptable. So another aspect is that if we can also present it more as a as an activity for rediscovering India's cultural heritage, India's past. See, what has happened is that Indian politics was largely based on two things, caste and religion. So, you know, you have vote banks based on religion, based on caste. But slowly things are changing and two things are happening. And one is that it is based on economics. You know, who can help us grow economically better? And that means... The, in, in some ways, if people become more concerned about, or you can say not just concerned about, people become more optimistic about the possibility for material improvement, then religious differences don't matter. Religious issues don't matter so much. For me. If this world is always dark for me, then I want to make sure my other world is going to be bright. And whatever it takes, I'll do for that. But if this world can become brighter for me, so when he said that religion is the opium of the masses, it was not entirely wrong. It was used in a particular way. Religion is exploited. There was the one communist thinker who said that the world will never know peace till the neck of the last aristocrat is strangled with the intestines of the last priest. <laughs> <laughs> so what we call as Brahman and Kshatriyas who are the heads of society there was a very unfortunate and vicious nexus between, between the aristocrats and the clergy in, in Europe, in Christianity, both Protestants and Catholics, and that led to problems. So the point is, it, now some of us may say that in Europe, we may have heard about how Islamic population is increasing in Europe, and Islam may become, uh, sorry, Europe may become Islamic. I have talked with several devotees in Europe and they say that, yes, Muslims are increasing in Europe, but to the extent they become culturally integrated, they become educated, hmm? they become employed in the mainstream of European economy. To that extent, they become more and more de-radicalized. If they don't get integrated, then radicalization happens more. And more. So the point I'm making over here is that if even with Muslim Islamic extremism, if there is no uh, when does Islamic extremism grow? See how many terrorists arise. They're not just terrorist planners, but terrorists arise from Saudi Arabia and uh, Kuwait. Most of the terrorists, ground level terrorists, they come from Pakistan and Afghanistan. These are poor countries. So there may be power hungry people who may be from the Middle East, but the power hungry people are able to manipulate people those who are powerless. So in that sense, if material well-being is assured, so when Krishna says dharma samsthapana yata samba mami yuge yuge, so when he's talking about dharma, he's not just talking about bhakti. He's talking about material order, order and material welfare. That is the primary duty of Kshatriyas. So to the extent that can be done, to that extent also, what will happen is this uh, religious polarization, religious suspicion will decrease. 
So if we can present that we are not here to convert from one religion to another, but we are here primarily to like rediscover and represent the traditional the traditional wisdom that of India, that is also very acceptable. Somehow nationalism and Hindutva, they are linked, quite linked. But Hindutva is seen negatively, nationalism is not seen that negatively. So it's a subtle matter of positioning. If you can present ourselves attractively, there are problems, but they can be overcome. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Come back to you if you don't mind. Uh, regarding this uh, narrative, creating a narrative, positive narrative, uh, something, doing something on that, or changing the textbooks. So there are different devotees who are working at it, but I don't know whether somehow what has happened is we we are not seen till now so much as mainstream Hinduism. See, ISKCON is respected as a brand in India, but you know we have not identified ourselves with any of the major Hindu causes. So you know whether we will be whether the government will entrust to us the responsibility of changing textbooks. So I doubt it. So there are devotees that at least in Delhi, some devotees are discussing things. And I would say there's a lot of opportunity which we have not tapped. So we as a movement have, uh, how should I put it? You know, we have created like a, dis or kept a distance from the concerns of the broader Hindu community. So to the extent we start showing concern, then we will also get opportunities. Once you get opportunities, surely something can be done. Right now, I feel we need to build bridges more than take up causes. Because you know, before we can take up a cause on somebody's behalf, we have to earn their trust. So most people feel, I mean, again, I don't, I don't want to be critical of ISKCON. Prabhupada and ISKCON has given me everything that I value in my life. But the point is, ISKCON is seen as more concerned about expanding its membership than protecting Hinduism. So when that is the perception, now the, the two are not exclusive, both can be done. But when, when it is pursued like that, you know, Hindus are not going to entrust their causes to us. Because we have to earn their trust first. Yes. We uh, brilliantly presented uh, understanding the current context in which we are with uh, what role does it play understanding uh, our position or the personal uh, preference that a person has? And uh, some of us here might feel that this is all too big for me to even think about. Yeah. I just have my style, I think, whatever it is. It's not going to matter much to my tiny existence or whatever. And I just go about really and not really see, understand the context or understand. So, mm -hmm. That's like, sometimes that also is an important factor. Yeah, that's true. So, two parts. First is that, <clears throat> you know, we may have our own small part and how is all this knowledge relevant for us? And also, so, so our own self-understanding or self-conception and our preference also. Oh, this matter. Yeah, see, there are two ways of looking at it. If we are going to talk about social issues and social causes, in many ways, that is largely, like, if you talk about circle of influence or circle of concern, most of it is out of our circle of influence. But the point is, if we don't talk about it, it will forever stay out of our circle of influence. It is, it is only when we articulate positions on these issues then people will start seeing us as socially relevant. I'll just take a few minutes to answer this question. See, broadly, you know, there are... That's okay, I know, I can write from here. See, there are, you can see there are four modes of communication. This insider, insider, outsider, outsider. I think I had, you may have, have heard about it. So insider, insider communication is like our Bhagavatam class, Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhav. Hmm? Then insider, outsider is our typical preaching. Hmm? Now, in general, the conception within our movement, at least 10, 15 years ago was outsider, insider, that is not required. They are all ignorant people. We have to enlighten them. We don't have to learn anything from them. 
But actually, if we are going to engage with contemporary issues, the issues are not simple. We have to understand those issues. We have to study those issues. So for addressing contemporary issues, outside and inside of communication may also be required. So we are working. If you see our movement originally was only doing this. Just you can say preaching, Sankirtan. But slowly we are doing this. Now, Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Yoga, this kind of course of insider and insider is also happening. And slowly we are recognizing that some, some of us are at least recognizing the value of outsider and insider. But the outsider and outsider communication is also important. What do I mean by that? Say, if two ordinary people from Mumbai, what do you think about ISKCON? So, what are they going to say? That is going to shape the public perception significantly. So, for example, in the West, in India, Hinduism is a lewd religion. In the West, if somebody encounters a Hare Krishna devotee, they, they, they never heard about something like this. So, what are they going to do? They're going to search in Google. Maybe they'll go to Wikipedia. So, what does Wikipedia say about ISKCON? What does Wikipedia say about Vaishnavism? That is important. So, the point is that we now, maybe at in the initial 50, 20, 30 years of the moment, we thought that all outsiders will become insiders. But now, more or less, we have understood that you know it's not likely to happen immediately. It's going to take a lot of time. So then, how outsiders see us is also going to matter for us. And then for that, the outsider, outsider communication is important. So when we, we are able to give mature comments on social issues, we may not be able to influence them. But what will happen is, we'll say, these people are sensible people. There was one survey done in the 1980s, 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, about in, uh, in America and Australia. So what do you think about the Hare Krishnas? Hmm? So there's one prominent thread, is a, a jolly group of impractical people. <laughs> so now, <laughs> is that how we want to be pursued? So yes, uh, generally social, commenting on social issues is, is broadly out of our immediate circle of influence. But we may not be able to influence the issue, but those who are concerned about those issues, our positions on them will influence whether they will come to us or not. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it matters for us. And as far as individuals, as far as our preference or even our influence in outreach, that depends on individual inspiration. You know, we are all parts of something far bigger than ourselves. So when we understand that bigger, that can also give us some inspiration. Okay, All this is also happening. And all this can also be a part of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. But okay, I am doing this part. This is what Krishna has empowered me. Let me do this as well as I can. So in one sense, ego is to think that, you know, I, some, I position someone, if you consider a pendulum, you no, know, ego is one extreme. Ego is I am the whole. I am the whole. You know, what I am doing is the whole of Krishna consciousness. Hmm? So I am everything or I am the whole, that is ego. Then the other is insecurity. That is I am nothing. I am worthless. What I am doing makes no difference at all. But humility is, I am a part of something bigger than myself. So understand that bigger as much as I can and do my part as well as I can. So in that sense, humility is actually in between ego and insecurity. So when we become very judgmental about others, this is not wrong, this is, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. We may be succumbing to the ego. And when we start feeling what I am doing you know, who is going to hear it? I do some program and 10, 15 people come and millions of people are there in the world. What is the difference you going to make? That is succumbing to insecurity. So humility means that we understand I'm a part. So now depending on our particular, as you said, our preference, our nature, how much of the whole we understand, that will, or we can understand, we are interested in understanding, that will vary. And how clearly we understand our part, that may also vary. Some people may just say, okay, this is the service I was told to do. I've been doing it. I'm happy doing it. But for those who don't feel content in that way, they want an understanding, then such understanding is available. So I would say this is this kind of analysis is one resource for us to aid us in our own practice and our sharing of Krishna consciousness. It may be a valuable resource for some, may not be a relevant resource for many. Okay. Last question, and it's done.
कई लोग तो ऐसे क्लास इज कॉन्सेंट्रेटेड ऑन बीइंग इंक्लूसिव इन अप्रोच इट्स इट्स अपेलिंग बट व्हेन आई मस्ट सेट द अपोजिट पार्टी काइंड ऑफ पीपल हु आर देयर हु हैव देयर स्क्रिप्चर्स एंड एवरीथिंग प्रैक्टिसेस आर बेस्ड ऑन एक्सक्लूसिव दैट हाउ दे आर ग्रेट एट रेस्ट ऑन आर यूजलेस so when we are confronting or when we are dealing with this those kind of people for example as a nation as a nation head a person may have to deal with all the gulf countries but we know qatar and saudi arabia is funding for islamic extremism across the globe so we know that qatar is doing that we know saudi arabia is doing that still we are trying to get them we know that taliban is in the government still we have to open an embassy today or tomorrow so on a practical level when we are saying devari level ke kuch karna chahiye and it is so complex that we may be directly support i mean we have to engage with pakistan and no matter how many security forces we bring in kashmir still we are not going to go till the point pakistan is fragmented so knowing all those things and still being inclusive and trying to see that we are good and it becomes really difficult and at least on my personal level whenever i keep Hearing about killings and everything, it educates my mind like anything. Because कर तो कुछ नहीं रहा हूँ, but चर्चा बहुत हो रही है. So how do I come out of it? Yeah, that is tough. We see that when there is exclusivism, and then there are extremist activities also going on, and we see that they are they are always going to keep going on. It's not easy to it's not going to stop. So how do we stay calm? How do we engage? Well, it's tough. See, this is where I find that. Uh, the framework of the three modes is very helpful to look at that there is uh, there is sattva guna rajo guna tamo guna all three kinds of people are there mm-hmm. uh, in every religious group mm-hmm. the question is that who is influencing who is in power so if you consider like a uh, we have another mark yeah, 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 yeah. mm-hmm. If you consider, so these are the leaders. These are the followers. The four quadrants we consider. So actually, I am writing a book on Bhagavad Gita and political philosophy. So this is a this is a. Now I mean, what I am doing is, what does Bhagavad Gita say about democracy? What will it talk about religious tolerance? What would the Bhagavad Gita say about communism, capitalism? I am writing essays on that. So this is one article from that. So if you say the leaders in say. Rajas and Tamas, followers in Rajas and Tamas. Here you will have leaders in Sattva. Here you have followers in Sattva. So every religion, it is not a Sattva is present only in Hinduism and Rajas and Tamas is present in Islam or something like that. This is human psychological divisions and they are there everywhere. So the best case situation is this one: that there are leaders in Sattva and there are followers in Sattva. now this is best and is highly unrealistic <laughs> because majority of the people will be rajastama guna era sabai achana as prabhupad said but if the leaders are in sattva they will keep the followers accountable they will make sure that the followers don't get carried away they will have some level of control on it and now if we consider the leaders are in rajastamas and the followers are in sattva Now, when I am talking about followers, if we can say among the followers also the influential followers, the so followers also not all equally equal level. So, for example, uh, now if there is a democracy and the leaders are very exploitative, manipulative, and eventually they become exposed. You know, they, they are just filling your own gaining power while sending us to while sending us to poverty or sending us to death in the battlefield, and they can also hold people accountable. So, this is you could say. This is better. This is better. This is better also. It's okay. Now, if you consider the followers and Rajyot Guna Tamo Guna, the leaders and Sattva Guna, this is also good. Hmm? Or rather, you know, if you put it like, this is better. This is good. So the leaders and Sattva Guna that is the best. That is better. But now this is the nightmare scenario, where the leaders are in Tamo Guna and the followers also in Rajyot Tamo Guna Rajyot Guna. that is like a nightmare scenario so what happens is 
in every tradition there will be all three kinds of people and at different times uh, leaders will be from different modes so when this happens so this is one point uh, this analysis number three modes then all religions uh, there has been something like a brahmana and kshatriya so brahmana is more associated with spiritual power kshatriya is associated more with political or martial power so if you see in in, uh, in buddhism there was buddha and there was ashoka ashoka and other kings they were primarily propagated in buddhism in christianity jesus was more like a brahmana and constant and other kings were like the kshatriya then the roman empire became the holy roman empire they adopted christianity then it spread very fast so but among the world's religions islam is unique in one sense where the center of religious spiritual power and political power are one hmm? muhammad was both and politician politics is in some ways a dirty business you have to do all kinds of things it just uh, i'm not defending some of the morally questionable actions of muhammad i think that politics does have questionable actions to be done it happens so for many muslims at an individual level they may look at muhammad's spiritual teachings and there are spiritual teachings not all of them but there are spiritual teachings and spiritually conducive teachings in in islam also and they live a more pious life they live more charitably they give up relatively some some aspects of materialism not everything some aspects of materialism so it gives them it raises them their consciousness to some level so individually islam can be a way to a more spiritual life for followers of islam but collectively when the most leaders of islam they when they influence their followers now they quote not the spiritual teachings of muhammad but his political example and that is why collectively islam often becomes more a political search for power than a spiritual search for god or truth and that is where islam becomes problematic so that's where islamic theocracy is no they will agitate for their rights when they are in minority but as soon as they get majority they will eliminate other people's rights so that that is a problem with islam and one of the reason that problem is there is because there has not been any systematic encounter of islam with modernity see the encounter of christianity with modernity happened in what is called as the renaissance happened in the 16 17 18 centuries itself the bhakti no thakur was a time when what is called as the hindu renaissance happened that hinduism encountered modernity and then most of the modern influential hindu movements arose from that dynamic now in islam this never really happened systematic so that's why it's a free for all that people will live in many different ways within islam and the religious authorities can sometimes exploit a lot so what happens is and generally if one religion criticizes another religion then it immediately causes polarization if hindus say muslims are bad it is they will say muslims will say that as that this is attack on our faith and actually that is true if muslims criticize hinduism also they say oh you have this you have the sati system you have this dowry burnings we will even say you know why are you only looking at that there's so much good in hinduism we will become defensive so generally if religion is to be reformed it is best done from inside not outside so what needs to be done is if we roughly equate extremists with those who are rajwan tamaguna and we equate moderates with those who are satpaguna so the moderates in islam need to be empowered moderate leaders and moderate followers when we equate when we equate islam with its extremist now you may say that the extremists are the majority or majority are at least passive extremists not activists no? that may be true but there are moderates also when we equate islam with ex- extremists then what happens is the extremists they feel anyway the moderates their voice is not going to be heard only so the moderates become completely sidelined and then islam is handed over more and more towards extremists so to the extent the moderates are engaged the moderates are empowered and they can critique islam they can now sometimes they may also be persecuted but the chance of they being persecuted or they being rejected as kafirs is lesser than somebody from other religion being rejected 
So now it's not easy. It's it's tough. But if you consider, let's say, Islam in Indonesia, Malaysia, it is relatively not that fanatical as compared to Islam in the Middle East. Hmm? So why is that? Because you know they they they're influenced differently. The, the extremist influences have not come over there. So exclusivism as an ideology does not have to lead to extremism as a lifestyle. Exclusivism is my way is the only way to go. Christianity is also exclusivist in its philosophy. Jews are also exclusivist, but they are not that extremist. So exclusivism and extremism are not the same thing. We cannot change. We neither we as other religious people, people from other religions, or even the moderates, they are unlikely to change the exclusivist ideology. That is going to be what it is. But exclusivism in thinking to extremism in living, that is not a necessary link. That can be stopped, and that can be stopped if those in goodness are empowered. So if moderates can be empowered. that means le- le- now how can moderates be empowered one is by giving opportunity for moderates to speak not just to the rest of the world so that they they just uh, they just like whitewash islam but let them speak to other muslims and then they will okay this also makes sense this makes sense this makes better sense this then what is what are, what our mullahs are teaching this makes better sense so out of it and then they, they, people are see people there are few people who are brainwashed but not everybody is brainwashed uh, many times uh, islam, muslims also feel threatened and there are reasons they feel threatened i won't go into that in america has played america has manipulated islam quite a bit and islam is now attacking america that's complicated but the point is that uh, if moderates are empowered then definitely internal reform is possible and that's how we can even if not a peaceful but at least a less volatile less violent situation we can come towards now this does not mean that we don't need kshatriyas kshatriya approach is required we need defense we need uh, we need disciplinary action we need correction we need retaliation when required but that alone is not going to solve the problem we also need to work to internally reform islam in france uh, macron is the president over there so he has said that he wants to one of the things he did was which really angered the middle east muslims they said that you know we want muslims to be french citizens first and that's why he said no international preachers of islam will be allowed to come to france he says you learn you learn islam but you learn it from people who are in france no international preachers will be allowed and he has a proposal that all the all the talks in all the mosques that has not been passed says all the talks will be there will be cctv and the french government will be able to have access to and hear all the talks that are and then we'll find out who are the radical elements and then we will isolate the radical elements so that second proposal has not been passed the first has been passed so it is possible that just because there is extremism ideology that does not mean people have to become radicalized so either if the followers are if the more and more people become well educated now i am not saying education itself is a alone a solution from for insurance against fanaticism but people become educated people interact with other people as as long as muslim thing all those other people are our enemies out to destroy us but when muslims go to the same university the others go to muslims work in the same job the others these people are not as all that bad as i was taught so what happens is either the muslim masses get integrated with the rest of society through education through employment and other things then that rajasik tamasik view of others will decrease they may not they may still be in rajoguna but that view of others may not be that much and or their leaders or moderates become their leaders then also things can improve okay so thank you very much shri prabhupad ki gaurav bhakta vrind ki gaurav prema nandi